discussing the Smiths, Hannah Whitehall Smith and Robert Pearsall, P-E-A-R-S-A-L-L Smith, who were the leaders of this movement in Britain. Pearsall Smith had traveled throughout Europe and the response to his ministry had been so dramatic that people said, we have to get everybody together. And so the Brighton Convention came into being. And Smith was preaching the simple message that Jesus saves me now, and by salvation he meant full salvation, that is, Jesus saves and fills me with his spirit now. Smith was a Quaker who had become a Presbyterian and was preaching basically the essential message of Wesley in a Presbyterian context in which they usually use terminology like the victorious life or the higher Christian life uh, to uh, evidence the kind of experience which Methodists called the experience of entire sanctification or being filled with the Spirit. And so they gathered in this place, and one of the interesting features of the Brighton meeting was not only the crowds and not only the attention which was given, but the speaking of Hannah Whitehall Smith. Remember now, we're still in the 19th century. I've been reminding you that we are in a different context. We don't still today, if a woman talked to a convention, as Billy Graham's daughter did to the Amsterdam Convention, of that many people, it's still a kind of significant event and a place for a woman to do so in this day. Imagine what it was like in the 1890s when women were not allowed to vote. They had no status in many places in society. They were basically homemakers. And here comes this Quaker woman speaking to all the ministers of Europe in the sense of the gathering and uh, from all denominations, from places where they didn't think a woman should even speak, Presbyterians and Baptists and others who were not as familiar with women's ministry as the Quakers were. And the result was that uh, she was the, the hit of the, of the convention. <laughs> as uh, we used to say sometimes in the, in the Pilgrim Holiness and Wesleyan Church, where there were many women ministers, she could preach better than her husband. <laughs> And uh, that, was a, that was a common comment many times. So uh, uh, she uh, didn't say she preached, she, she spoke, she testified. You see, the way women kind of slipped in behind this preaching business was that they said, the Lord wants me to testify. And of course, in, meeting, in a Methodist meeting, that basically meant preach because Methodist preaching was a lot of testimony and exhorting to experience and so forth. And so uh, when a woman did that, they said, well, uh, women are not supposed to preach. They said, no, the Spirit's just leading me to testify. And so this is the way that uh, it, kind of, it kind of came about. And uh, the effects of this meeting were tremendous. Uh, Moody, Dwight L. Moody, the famous evangelist of the time and the leader of this awakening, Moody sent a telegram down to Smith before the meeting uh, saying that he felt he was having a big meeting in London at the same time. They were both in England at the same time. The two revivals going on, the Holiness Revival and Moody's Revival, which was more general revival. And uh, Moody sent a message down to Smith saying that probably that meeting was the most significant meeting in the Christian church that he anticipated it would be. This is before the meeting, not after the meeting. He anticipated it would be one of the most uh, important meetings in the Christian church since apostolic times. Now, of course, that was a rather parochial view, perhaps, of what God was doing in the world, but nevertheless, uh, in the English-speaking world, this was his estimation, estimation of it, what we call the Anglo-Saxon societies of the day, who were kind of the colonial ruling powers of the, of the, of the day. And so, uh, the Brighton meeting was a very, very significant meeting. You see, the movement had caught up many, many people. Many of the younger people who see this tape, uh, who are acquainted with English literature and English theology in the evangelical world and inner varsity and places like that, will recognize the name, of course, of George MacDonald right off the bat, because MacDonald was the mentor of C.S. Lewis, probably one of the most influential evangelical persons in the last century. Uh, he is the one who kept many young college students and university students in the Christian faith by giving them a rational basis for their faith. And so C.S. Lewis owed much of that to MacDonald, George MacDonald. And MacDonald was at 
Hannah Whitehall Smith's meetings. Uh, we have in our records at Asbury, in our archives, we have a picture of Broadland's estate, which was the large estate where they used to hold summer camp meetings as part of this revival. And there, I have a picture of McDonald and Hannah Whitehall Smith and Amanda Smith, the black evangelist, and uh, other people from the uh, English Anglican Society, kind of the upper crust, all standing on the front of the Broadlands estate in one of the holiness camp meetings, which was being held there for Oxford and Cambridge students who came down during the summer to hear the message of the victorious Christian life. And so through these kinds of, through these kinds of meetings, uh, the Great Brighton meeting finally was held and kind of was the summit of it. Now, people generally in, in evangelical society today do not know the whole story. As uh, one of our famous radio commentators says, this is the rest of the story. <laughs> uh, after the meeting, Hannah Whitehall Smith and her, and her uh, daughters and some of her other friends and sisters went over to Switzerland for a little relaxation. It had been a rugged schedule. They had been traveling evangelists, living out of their bags, of course living in very good quarters because they were living in some of the finest homes in Britain, uh, which shows that a different level of people uh, socially at that time was being involved in the movement. And uh, they were getting into the Anglican church, but it was, it was traveling evangelism, which some of us know a little bit about. Living out of a bag, but they had a lot of bags. They were, they were well-to-do people. They had porters to carry them around, and they had hosts who kind of gave their big houses over to them, but it was still not home. And so a vacation was needed after this great revival. They went to Switzerland, had a great time. Uh, just a side note, at Asbury we have all the pictures that Smith took. He was quite a photographer. We have all the pictures that Smith took on these trips to Germany and of the Empress Augusta of Germany, whom he influenced for the gospel through her daughter. And uh, on, on down through, uh, we have these pictures from 1875 when the meeting was held. Uh, in the, uh, the actual originals in the uh, archives at, uh, at Asbury. And uh, so it was, a, it was a time of relaxation and rest for them, but it wasn't for Smith. After the meeting, Smith had gone to one of the large homes of one of his friends, and there he was editing the notes of the meeting. The Brighton meeting has been published in a regular hardback book, all the meetings and summary of what was said and so forth and who was there, a kind of a summary of the convention and conference. And uh, he was doing this and in the home was, was a young woman who uh, was part of the family, they were in a family situation and he had been there before. And uh, she came to him one day, she said, for counsel, for spiritual counsel. I think she was 18, 19 years old. Uh, she says that he took her on his lap and to counsel her. And that is about all that we know and all that has ever been found out about it. No further accusations of anything were made except that she was too, or he was too familiar with her. Uh, the family made nothing of it and of course we know these situations are very complicated in contemporary society to decide just what's going on and what isn't going on and when there's a, a kind of undue action which is not, not the case. But at any rate, in addition to that, some of Smith's committee, who were of other theological persuasions and not of Quaker or Wesleyan persuasion, and who didn't like the fact that an Arminian movement was kind of dominating the religious scene in England, which was basically Calvinistic and Anglican, they thought that he was beginning to teach some doctrines which were not too correct. And the one of them was, and it fitted in with the other situation, and I'll just be quick on this because I just give this as a matter of historical reality and interest because I'm going to touch on a contemporary situation. One of them was that bridal mysticism was taught. Now, bridal mysticism basically is a theology of relationship with Christ which was followed by many Catholic nuns. You know, when a Catholic nun takes her orders, they oftentimes put on a wedding ring because they're married to Christ. And Smith began preaching this because in the holiness movement, 
the marriage to Christ idea was a very big, very big deal. And the old Hebrew words for married were used in the movement and in the preaching. In other words, we are the bride of Christ. It was all legitimate biblical teaching. But some women, both in the old Catholic movement and this particular woman whom Smith had preached this to, they took it too far to where we were actually getting into the physical sensations of sexual relationships. And in other words, Christ becomes the bride. And it begins to slip over into a mysticism of union with Christ, which is always a danger in Christianity. We get mystical. The Moravians did this when they talked about crawling into the wounds of Christ, the Moravian church, in the early days at one point. Well, that gets a little too, a little too mystical. And the church has always shied away from it. Well, they accused Smith of teaching this, and this woman took it up and uh, wrote him a number of letters in which she told how she felt when Christ would come to her. Now, in that kind of mix, his committee, for whatever reason, and I have my own suspicions historically that it wasn't all because of that. Unfortunately, church, uh, churches sometimes are not apolitical. And power and who, has, who calls the shots sometimes means more than what the truth really is. And uh, we all know that in our church work. That's just a reality, and it happens even in, in holiness churches. And so uh, they dumped him. He readily admitted everything that uh, had happened. There was no evasion on Smith's part, I must say, for his part. And I don't want to completely exonerate him in any way because none of us really know the facts today. I do know that his friends never deserted him, and by that I mean the Mount Temples, who were the owners of Broadlands, this great estate. They always stood by him very strongly. And uh, all kinds of uh, other people supported, uh, but it, d it demolished him. Remember yesterday we said, I, I have a strong conviction, and the family does too, well, the ones I have met. Uh, the family still believes that he was a manic, depressive person. And this threw him down into the depressive stage. It just destroyed him. Because uh, he felt the committee had treated him unfairly. Not that he was defending himself, because he's very open about it. And uh, said that, yes, he had gone too far in the bridal mysticism thing and probably encouraged people to go too far. But uh, the committee didn't hear him. They just, like that, they just cut him off. And he was, and he was done for because... Uh, they were already afraid of this American movement which was taking over English evangelicalism. That's, that's my understanding of it, and I have a lot of good historical backing for that. Well, the result was it destroyed him. And as, as Hannah Whitehall Smith was coming back from her vacation in, in Europe, uh, in Switzerland with her friends, on the train coming in toward Paris, she got a telegram saying, go immediately to a certain hotel in Paris your husband needs you. And so uh, imagine this after that meeting. All of a sudden, this emergency message. She goes to the hotel room in Paris, and there she finds him just completely wiped out. He's, he's gone as far as his composure collection. Because after all of this mania, this manic upper in which he had been having these great meetings, all of a sudden it's all gone and completely destroyed. She gathers him up and picks up the pieces and gets him to England and to some of their friends, and they take a little rest on one of the great estates in England, other friends. She puts him on the USS Pennsylvania, the steamship Pennsylvania, and takes him back to Philadelphia. In America, the American church, of course, heard about it and knew about it. The whole evangelical world knew about it. I've read all the newspapers in England, all the religious papers, and researched them on it. It just, it was... The reason I bring it up is that the television evangelists are not the first ones to go through this kind of traumatic thing. That's why history is sometimes, sometimes a good thing. It's kind of a balancing for you. And uh, it was very similar to that. And uh, in a different situation, a much more puritanical age, much more strict age, ethically and socially. And uh, so it was, it's called Smith's Fall, just like we talk about the fall of the television evangelists or other others who failed. The American church didn't accept the fact that Smith had really erred, erred far or, or uh, much, and uh, immediately he was offered camp meetings, but they only took one at Framingham, Massachusetts, with their friend Charles Cullis, who we'll mention when we get to the healing movement. And uh, uh, 
Hannah Whittle Smith says in her journals, she says the same power was there, the same results, everything was the same, but we were not. They had been, they had been hurt by it. It never destroyed her. She always maintained her faith and lived with him the rest of her life under very difficult circumstances sometimes, but uh, she kept her faith, but uh, she was through being a holiness evangelist as such. She went on to become a leader in the WCTU. She was a good friend of Frances Willard. She was always a woman's rights advocate of the time for women's votes. In fact, when her daughter uh, knew that a bill was gonna go through uh, Parliament in England, in which she was living at that time, I'll get to that story a little bit, in women's rights discussion, when, we got, when they knew they were going to pass a bill to give women the vote, she had her wheeled in her wheelchair up to Parliament to demonstrate. This is the holiness evangelist who spoke to these 10,000 pastors. So uh, she, is, uh, she, is some, she is some person. Again, not perfect, but a tremendous, tremendous leader and a very influential person in, in our world. So uh, that's the Brighton Convention. It sounds like it's a downer. And in many ways it was. I've read all the literature and read all the letters and inside and out. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a sad and pathetic story of a triumph and then defeat, uh, apparently. And you would think that after that kind of experience, the whole other world in England and, and Europe and so forth would forsake the revival. But they didn't. That's, that's the, this is the rest of the story. <laughs> Because before this event happened, and before the Smiths kind of faded out of the picture, several important people had been converted to this message in the Anglican Church. And one of them was a pastor at a little town up in Keswick, England. Now remember, that's K-E-S-W-I-C-K, -K, but the W is silent in the English pronunciation. It's Keswick, England up in the Lake District, which was like our uh, resort area in the Poconos, <laughs> but a little nicer. And uh, they, uh, they had set up a meeting to immediately follow the Big Brighton meeting before any of this other stuff happened. And that meeting went ahead. And out of that meeting was formed the now famous and memorable and historical Keswick Movement. And the, the, the meetings were called Meetings for the Promotion of Scriptural Holiness, the same name that the NHA used in America. And in fact, the NHA camp meetings were the format, the American camp meetings were the format for the kind of meetings which were held up at Keswick. Because there was no big building there at that time, there was no uh, even permanent tabernacle. Every year when Keswick met in July, as it did this, uh, this July in 1875, Every year that Keswick met, they put up a tent. And so, in essence, you have in England, among Anglicans, the recreation of the Methodist and Baptist and Presbyterian camp meeting from America. And uh, this is significant because there were Methodists who had adopted the camp meeting format before that, but they weren't very popular. They were called the Primitive Methodists. And they had a camp meeting once a year, and the other Methodists didn't like it because it was too much American, too informal, uh, too uh, un-British, un or whatever else it may have been. And so the primitive Methodists split away from the Methodist church in England, basically over the camp meetings, which they held at Malcrop, uh, the Malcrop camp meetings up in uh, Malcop, uh, camp meetings up in, uh, in England. So now the interesting thing is you see some of the Anglican evangelicals holding their camp meeting in Keswick in a resort area, which is so typical of what was done with many Methodist camp meetings at the same time in the United States. What I'm trying to say is this is now a worldwide movement, and its influencers are flowing back and forth between the United States and the English-speaking world. And I have to use that word because at that time, of course, this was the channel through which we communicated through the mission stations, through uh, these countries which were prominent and dominant in world leadership at that time, particularly England. And so through Keswick, we have a whole new movement developed which has been influential and is still influential in all of evangelicalism around the world, and particularly, uh, particularly influential in missions work. That's the key here.
Keswick was a great mission center. It's here that eventually some of the great student missionary conferences were held, in which the college students of the world at Yale and Cambridge and Harvard and all of these schools were challenged to go out and reach the world for Christ. So Keswick became a tremendous missionary center. And I'm going to take the chance there to go off on that tangent and say that the modern holiness movement, as it gradually developed into the holiness churches, was strongly missionary-minded, even as Wesley was. The world was its parish, even as Wesley had said. There was no place that was off-bounds for spreading the gospel in line with the Great Commission, going to all the world, not half of it, not a quarter of it, not a part of it, but all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we all know well enough that sometimes missionaries preached a lot more than the gospel, just as some preachers preach more than the gospel at home. And so we got some strange aberrations in which culture is preached for gospel. And those of us who are in history and, of course, in the church know that that's one of the main accusations against the missions of this period, that basically it was as much Americanism or British culture as it was the gospel. But the simple fact is that underneath all of that problem, the gospel got through because God's word is not limited sometimes by our parochialism or our limitations, but it's where the gospel is preached. When you cast your bread on the waters, the Bible says it will return. And do you know today these tremendous people that are coming into our country, into the United States from other mission fields, are a fruit. They're coming back to regenerate regenerate the American church, and the, the bread is coming back, which was spread by whatever means all around the world through particularly the, uh, particularly the, uh, the holiness missions. And uh, I want to mention one man who was very influential in all of Methodist missions and in all of our holiness missions, and that is Bishop William Taylor. And I want to just take this occasion to, because he's so critical, to, to get him into our thinking. Bishop William Taylor was born, uh, as you note, uh, I live history as well as teach it, and every, I'm always making connections. Bishop William Taylor was born in Bells Valley, Virginia, just about 30 miles from where I presently live, in the same area that my wife's father's family lived. They probably went to church together. They were Methodists back there. And uh, Bishop William Taylor eventually became the Mr. Missionary of the Methodist Church. But at the same time, he was very strongly involved in the National Holiness Association. He was a member of the NHA, which was the evangelism wing of the holiness movement in Methodism. We've talked about that. And uh, he was as all of these entrepreneurs are in Christianity as well as in business or anything else or education, he was a guy that did some things different. He believed that missionaries should not go out with support from a whole missionary board other than to have them as an author authorization. He believed when they got to the field they should work and live with the people and make their own money and support themselves and with whatever gifts came from people at home but not by any regular promised support. What do we call that? We call that faith missions. So here is the man who probably didn't invent faith missions, but certainly was the one who made it uh, a broad reality in the church. And it was part of the holiness teaching. All of our early missionaries went out, quote unquote, by faith, with no promised support from any agency except the belief that God's people would support them. But Taylor went a little further by saying they actually ought to work on the field in some way to make their money. Now he was a living example of that. Taylor supported himself by writing books. I don't know how he did it because you don't make much money writing books, I'll tell you that. I've had a few of them. Uh, it's, it's pin money usually unless you write uh, the, one of the big, uh, big sellers. But uh, he made his money by selling books because this is a period when everybody was interested in other nations. This is when we were beginning to expand the borders of, uh, of the knowledge of, of the people in the English-speaking world to the other world, Africa and Asia and South America and so forth. 
And so Taylor established Methodist missions in South, South America, in South Africa, in Australia, and in India. Those are, the, those are the major ones. All around the world he went with his missionaries, not sent out by the Methodist Church, but by Taylor, who was a member of the Methodist Church and a member of the NHA. And the NHA had a Taylor Fund. If you go back in the old God's Bible School and other homeless papers, you'll find a fund in which it shows how many people gave money to Bishop Taylor so that he could send out his missionaries. Now, naturally, most of a Methodist officialdom didn't like this because it's, you see, Methodism is so tightly organized and still is to a degree, not nearly so much, but tightly organized that uh, anything that wasn't under the institution was kind of suspect. And that's why the NHA and the wholeness movement was quite suspect in Methodism in the later years because it was something going on which wasn't exactly in the channels. That's a very important point as to the final division of the, of the movements. But Taylor's a good example of it. He stayed in Methodism. And so he went to these places. He got these missions started, and then he said to the Methodist mission agency, here it is. You see, B, if you went out and started a church somewhere and suddenly handed it over to your district, and you say, here, take it over. Well, sometimes they liked that, sometimes they didn't, because they may not even have a work there, and they had to start a whole work in South Africa, and they had to start a whole work in, in South America, and they had to start a work in India. But you know, the major Methodist works around the world have all their roots almost totally in Taylor's work. And he was a part of the NHA. Well, let me finish that story. By the way, he is the first one to bring the eucalyptus tree to California. That's another one of his, of his great things. Uh, he went to Australia and brought back some seeds, and the Californians have cursed Taylor ever since because the eucalyptus is like a weed in California. If you've been there and lived there, you know it grows everywhere, and it's kind of a dirty tree like a sycamore tree. And, uh, but Taylor's the one that, that brought it over from, uh, from Australia. He was an unusual guy. And uh, the Methodists thought he was unusual. They thought he was irregular. <laughs> but he was a good Methodist, and he was right in there pushing for Methodist missions, but he kind of did it on his own. And so the Methodists thought, well, we'll have to bring him under control. And so in about uh, one of the latter 1800s, or 1800s uh, conferences back in 1880, 1884, six, somewhere in there, they decided that they would elect a bishop for missions who would kind of organize this erratic missionary development which was happening in the church. Well, they didn't know it, but somebody got up on the floor and nominated Bishop Taylor or not Mighty Taylor, William Taylor, not Bishop at that time. And what happened, but the conference, of course, knew him so well, and he was, uh, his work was so notorious that everybody knew him. And who was elected bishop? Bishop Taylor, <laughs> the person whom they were putting in a bishop to control. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, Taylor lived out his life in the Methodist Church as bishop. One of the... One of the strange things about it is they would not pay his salary. <laughs> Every other bishop got salary, but they elected a bishop, and because it wasn't the one they didn't want, they didn't pay his salary. But that didn't bother Taylor, because Taylor was making his money on his books, and so he just kept writing books and uh, getting his money and doing his missions as bishop for the Methodist Church. It's, a, it's an interesting little ironic story. But uh, the result of it is that Methodist missions grew strong in India, the strongest Indian conference of the church, which became part of the Church of South India, which was a union with the Anglican Church in India. That is all Taylor's work. The uh, people at Asbury who were missionaries to England, the Siemens, you know, Dr. Siemens, who wrote the books on emotional healing and so forth. His father was one who worked in Taylor's work. And uh, all of the South India conference and a lot of the South American work and uh, a lot of the South African work and the African work uh, today is still a result of this man who went out and started missions all on his own and then said to the Methodist Church, here you are. But it's all, it's all that. I must tell one more story about him. <coughs> I was in uh, Oxford in England in the, the Methodist the Theological Institute, which I had the privilege of attending a couple times every five years it's held in, in Oxford. And uh, we were talking about the 19th century, about the, the century in which the holiness movement was 
one of the dominant elements in Methodism. And we had there people, Methodists from all around the world. And we had a rather, uh, a rather uh, uh, leftist, I don't mean communist, but a person from uh, one of the Nigerian country, I believe it was Nigeria, a bishop who was very much anti-missionary generally because of the colonialism which was charged to missionaries that they were taking over and merely anglicizing these countries rather than Christianizing them. In other words, that there was too much of a mixture of politics in with the gospel which was going out that some of you will pick up the implications in history of how missions uh, is charged with that. And uh, he, he was coming down pretty hard in the conference for a time. But then one of my colleagues from Asbury who was interested in William Taylor, David Bundy, read a paper to the conference. We all had to read a paper. Read a paper in which he talked about Taylor. And this bishop's face just lit up. I remember Taylor's an American missionary and the charges against English, English missionaries for taking this culturalism all around the world and suppressing certain elements of the cultural understanding of the people. And uh, he, he lit up. He said, oh, Bishop Taylor, he said, he started our church. And we just had our 100th anniversary. And we had a big picture of Bishop Taylor up on the platform. I want you to see the irony there. Here, here's, the, here's the person who was most critical of the cultural aspects of missions. And yet, Bishop Taylor, who did it his way, came across as being a person who was for them, even 100 years ago. So it was a most fascinating, most fascinating experience for some of us in the holiness movement. So we see the influence of, of uh, holiness uh, theology and thinking within Methodism and around the world in Keswick, and now we get back to Keswick because Keswick became one of the main centers of faith missions, the kind of missions which Bishop Taylor had indoctrinated the movement in. And uh, of course, he was not the only, ones, only one by any means there's another prominent leader who was very strong in Keswick and later on in the Holiness Movement whom all of you will recognize. Well, I, shouldn't, I don't say that anymore because I'm getting so old that not everybody recognizes what I recognize. Uh, <laughs> I will say I try to recognize what you recognize, but that's pretty tough sometimes. Hudson Taylor and the China Inland Mission. Hudson Taylor was a Keswick person. He is one who encouraged the Keswick movements because basically his theology was a victorious life theology. And Hudson Taylor went all around the world, and especially in China and other parts of Asia, with his great China Inland Mission, which became one of the main mission agencies, agencies of China. Uh, another one was Arthur T. Pearson, who was a Keswick leader. A. T. Pearson. Pearson is the one who wrote the Acts of the Holy Spirit, his title of his book on, on the uh, book of uh, Acts. He calls it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. A.T. Pearson was an American Baptist preacher who was also a Keswick preacher. And he came back to America and set up within the Baptist movement uh, his famous message of the place of the Holy Spirit in the church and emphasized the work of the Spirit. He wrote the book, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, another man that was influential in, uh, in the mission work was S.W. Zvemer, Z-V-E-M-E-R. When I took uh, uh, church history at Temple University as part of my temple training, I had, had to write on the relationship of Christianity to the other religions of the world. It was a major paper which we had to write to pass, uh, to pass for the master's degree. And I used Zwemer, who had written a very significant book on missions in the world in his time. I used him as a resource. He's a Keswick person. He came out of the Holiness Revival in, uh, in England under the Keswick term. Now, what was the difference between this critical movement, which especially was critical in missions, and also, by the way, in the InterVarsity movement, because the student Christian movement in England is basically rooted in Keswick. At, at Harvard, I mean at uh, Oxford and Cambridge, the major uni English universities, the student union is out of Keswick, basically. Uh, what, what was Keswick? Well, it was based on Smith's 
preaching and teaching and everything which contributed to the revival at that time. And it was basically this. Not emphasizing so much the cleansing element, which was an important part of Wesleyanism, that the heart can be made pure and cleansed, but it was a little more Calvinistic in that it said the flesh is not eradicated, as holiness people eventually said, and as Wesley said sometimes, it's not removed or cleansed. I like the word cleansing better than eradication, as we'll see in some discussion of that. The heart was not cleansed, it was overcome. Yes, suppression. We use the word suppression commonly. In other words, you can live a victorious Christian life. That's where the word victorious Christian life came in. In other words, the power of the Spirit in the baptism of the Spirit the power of the Spirit is able to help one live a Christian life, or live what? A life above sin. Now that's very close to Wesley and what we teach, but it's kind of a Presbyterian interpretation by the Smiths. They knew the Wesleyan message, and they were committed to the Wesleyan message, but they felt that if they put it in Wesleyan terms, immediately we would be turned off because Wesley was looked upon as being an Arminian, and Arminianism was, of course, one of those bad words as far as Calvinists were concerned because the contention between the two movements. So they cast it in the terms, and, but the important thing was this didn't happen by our decision, it happened by a second blessing. The Keswick people believed in a second blessing and it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it was a baptism for what? For power. Now I hope you're getting some of the implications of this for contemporary evangelicalism. You see, here we have the introduction of the element of victorious living and of power over sin, but not the removal or not the, not the uh, forgiveness or eradication or cleansing, cleansing is the word I like, not the cleansing of the heart so that the flesh is gone in the sense of rebellion against God. By flesh I mean the human innate cardinal, carnal sin of rebellion. Rebel, you don't rebel as a, as a Keswick sanctified person. They use the word sanctification. You don't rebel. You have given a heart of love, which means that you overcome any impulses to rebel. So it's kind of a, a grade theologically. It's a grade away from what we would call the standard understanding of Wesley concerning this experience. Wesley, and I say that because... I fear, uh, not with the fact that these people were not good Christians or one could not be a good Christian with this understanding, but I fear that as far as Wesleyanism is concerned, many of our people are Keswick. Many holiness people are Keswick. We oftentimes do not have a clear message that we can be cleansed from all sin, which was Wesley's statement. Now why don't we? Because the Calvinistic understanding of sin is so different from what Wesley defined as sin. Now, anything which is wrong before God is sin. But the Calvinists say anything that falls short of the glory of God is sin. In other words, when you and I do something stupid because we are in a sinful world, we are sinning because it's not up to the record, it's not up to the height. Wesley said that is sin but that is covered by the covenant of the blood. In other words, when we don't know what we're doing until God checks us and says, now that's up to, not up to my standard, and calls it to our voluntary response. See, here's your synergism I was talking about. In other words, it's not all what God does. We have to interact. God interacts. He wants a people who will obey Him, who will love Him, with hearts who will follow Him. He doesn't just want somebody's name on a record somewhere in heaven so you can get in when the time comes. He wants people who are going to be His people right now. And that demands interaction, or else we're just puppets. Now those are the extreme statements, and yesterday I cautioned everybody in the class, we have some new ones today, I cautioned everybody to not take my statements as ex cathedra from the Pope. I'm, I'm stating here very tightly and very succinctly things which uh, have arguments on all sides. They're all, they're all degrees of Calvinism, they're all degrees of Wesleyanism. <laughs> Uh, we're kind of coming down to what uh, this particular lecturer feels out of his lifetime study and experience in the church uh, is somewhere in there, hopefully in the middle of uh, reality. But if you believe that anything is sin which 
falls short of the glory of God in your life or the life of the church, then we sin in thought, word, but not in deed. <laughs> well, in deed, possibly too. We, th we sin in thought, word, and deed every day. But if you do what Wesley said, he said, I can't help those things because I'm stupid. Uh, when Adam fell, we were all encrusted with this loss of all kinds of abilities and so forth. Uh, I can't help that, and, and God knows that, and Jesus knows it, and when I do that, we are covered by the blood. In other words, that's where Jesus' righteousness does cover us. But Wesley said, that's not what God is concerned about in relationship. In relationship, God is concerned about how I respond to Him, because that's where He and I meet, in the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit tells me to do something and I don't do it, that's what God is really concerned about. Not that He has grades of sin, but as far as maintaining the kind of relationship He has set up in Jesus Christ, it's because in Christ I have to respond to Christ in my life because He's in me through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, that is where the rubber meets the road, as we say in our terminology. And therefore, He said, the sin for which God holds me accountable and where I have to stay in relationship with Him so that the blood may continue to be applied is voluntary sin, a sin of the will. In other words, it's rebellion or no rebellion. Now, that doesn't mean we do things perfectly, as we've emphasized again and again, because we don't know enough to do things perfectly, even with the grace of God, because God has not made us perfect human beings yet, and never will until we get to heaven. But we can have perfect hearts toward God. That's a word that the Bible uses. Serve Him with a perfect heart. Now that sounds high, but it's not. It's simply that you love God more than you love anything else. That's all it is. And if you love God more than you love anything else, you'll love your neighbor. Because God loves your neighbor and He says, as you treat those people, I will treat you. And that's where the rubber hits the road. And so the Western understanding is that we can be cleansed of rebellion. The Keswick understanding is we can overcome rebellion, but we still have that flesh in us. Now, you may say, well, that's not a big deal. No, theology, as Wesley would be the first to admit, is not the final word. But the simple fact is that eventually our theology catches up with us. And therefore, we have always been told to study God's Word. Why do we have to study God's Word? We have to study it to theologize it. Theology is not some book which some of us may write and, and get into Zondervan and get printed about sanctification or about anything else we may do. Theology is what every Christian does every day when they try to understand how God is working in the world. And when we understand how God is working in the world, it affects everything we do. So theology is critical in that sense, our understanding of God. And so uh, it does matter eventually whether you think the heart is cleansed or whether you think Flesh is just overcome. It does matter. In the long run, it shows up in various ways in which we treat our relationship with God. But we can't get into all of that today. I just say that hundreds and thousands of missionaries and workers around the world and ordinary people who are in the churches uh, doing the work of the church and the basic work of the church, men and women, all of these people who understood the Keswick message, uh, hundreds and thousands of them received the same experience that Wesleyans did when they espoused the understanding of Scripture and believed it for themselves in getting sanctified holy. In Presbyterianism, in Anglicanism, in, in Catholicism, in, in, every, in every place there is, this truth, we believe, is a biblical truth, and therefore it comes through. But when we read the Bible, we have to finally say what we think about it and how we live it and how we follow it and what we understand by it, and that determines the limits of our understanding of the Christian life. So theology is critical. But when we pick these points with Keswick, I don't want to by any means say that people cannot come to this experience by Keswick or without any knowledge of any holiness theology. Because it's simply this. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then your life has got to change. And anything less than full love for Him just won't match up, regardless what theology we put around it. Now, Keswick is still going. Unfortunately, it's not what it once was. John R. Stott, whom some of you will know well, one of the major Anglican uh, evangelical writers, especially for InterVarsity, very active in InterVarsity and the student Christian movement in England, 
was down to Asbury and I took him out for lunch because I was interested in Keswick and he's one of the leaders of Keswick now. And uh, sadly enough, uh, and here again, Stott's a great Christian, don't, don't mistake me, but he's not a great theologian, <laughs> I think, in this, in this sense. John R. Stott said, oh, we got rid of all that old stuff at Keswick. Well, when he did that, he got rid of Keswick because all of Keswick was basically the teaching of a second experience of the higher Christian life in, in the life of Christians, of the higher life in the life of Christians. And uh, essentially, he is going back to the old Anglican Calvinistic view in which he was raised. And he got rid of all that old stuff, which means that the old Keswick message was basically shunted aside. And Keswick is now still doing great work and still influencing a lot of people, a lot of Christian students for God, but in a, not in a Wesleyan-oriented context as far as some of the leadership is concerned. So uh, uh, that is Keswick in, in, in England. Now Keswick, I must take one more step, Keswick comes back to the United States. The Keswick leaders spoke over here frequently through the agency basically of D.L. Moody. Because when Moody held his revivals over there, Smith was there at the same time in the 1870s. And of course, leadership went back and forth between the two movements. And Keswick was reinforced by the wholeness message, and in fact, it became the heart of Keswick. That was the victorious Christian life. The movement came back to America, where a lot of people would not accept a Methodist camp meeting. They would go to a higher Christian life or victorious Christian life conference. Now, you may wonder why you have Presbyterian Bible conferences and Methodist camp meetings. They were for exactly the same pur purpose. Montreat, what's the one uh, up here in the Poconos? Uh, is that Mont No, it was Mont Montreat's down in North Carolina, Billy Graham, near Billy Graham's place. Montrose, Montrose in, uh, in uh, this area, isn't it? A Bible conference. All across the United States, Keswick's began to be established. And the result was, that Keswick movement fed its message back and forth across a whole realm of American evangelicalism, which would not turn to Methodism because of the, of the uh, natural uh, tensions which existed between Arminianism and Calvinism in American, in American revivalism. And so you see there's a dividing picture. However, that didn't show up immediately. It wasn't until about 1900 when, uh, when uh, R. A. Torrey became president of Moody Bible Institute around that period, that the two movements began to divide and kind of even argue with each other rather strongly. And from about 1910 on, we have the Moody movement, which is basically Keswick in America, and all the related things which supported Moody Bible Institute, and the Holiness movement, which is now starting its own schools at God's Bible School and schools like Asbury and so forth, and you have a division in evangelicalism on the higher Christian life element. We are not aware, I guess, that I, I just uh, saw some of the old uh, records of Moody Bible Institute. We're not aware that as late as the 1920s and 30s, Moody still had regular holiness meetings. And one of them, believe it or not, I read about, went all night long like a typical uh, holiness meeting may have done in some of the churches in revival time among the students. Some of the best Keswick literature on the higher Christian life comes out of Moody Press. They still print a lot of it. And Moody had these people over to his Northfield, Massachusetts conferences, which was his kind of Bible conference in Massachusetts, which now has the Northfield schools for boys and girls, one of the, one of the classical uh, elite uh, uh, training schools for uh, high school students in New England. And so, uh, the implications of the movement are just, are just unfathomable and uh, unimaginable. Uh, after Keswick, uh, we want to turn, and I think we better, better leave that there, except to say, I will say this, uh, the Taylor family, Hudson Taylor family, which came out of Keswick, eventually became Free Methodist. Uh, at Asbury Seminary, I think we have graduated now three generations of Taylor's, of Taylor's descendants. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Of course, he's back in the middle 19th century and 
So his grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh, have, uh, have uh, graduated from Asbury Seminary. I had, the, I had the privilege one time of handing a diploma to one of his great-grandsons great uh, at Asbury. So uh, this shows that the, mo the movements interacted and eventually some went one way and some went the other way into the Calvinistic higher life and into the holiness message. I got permission from, uh, from uh, one of the British uh, lords who now owns Broadlands, where I said the queen and her husband and Charles and Di had their honeymoons, which was the great hole in the center among that group of people in England, down in Southampton in the southern part of England. I got permission to go through the estate, which is now owned by the Mountbatten family, Lord Mountbatten. Of course, he was, he was killed in the 19, uh, late 1970s when he was blown up by the Irish Republican Army while he was on a boat up in vacation in Ireland. Lord Mountbatten is the one who ruled in India for England and then turned India over to the democratic system, which it now has. He was a relative of the Queen, of course. Mountbatten's are in the royal family. He owns Rodlands, where the Mount Temples were. I got permission to go through it. I wanted to see where Hannah Whitehall Smith had stayed and where everybody had stayed and kind of touch base on the historical roots there. When I got there, I called the man whom I was supposed to contact to manage the estate. And he said, well, uh, come in tomorrow and don't come in the front entrance, come in the back entrance. And he told me how to get into the estate, which was across the river from where I was, a beautiful rolling countryside. And uh, so the next morning I got up in Romsey, England, and uh, went in where I thought he said, but the further I went, the further I knew I was getting into territory I wasn't sure was right. And remember, he had just been assassinated two years before this and uh, the Irish Republican Army was still very active. And so uh, after a while, a young lady came along who apparently worked at the estate, and she kind of picked up with me, and she was kind of questioning me, and I told her what I was doing and who, was, who I was supposed to meet. But somewhere along the line, before we got to the barnyard of the estate, uh, which is now not a barnyard, but where it was, and uh, I must have tripped a detection device, which was around, uh, because of the heavy security was there at that time. And all uh, the bells broke loose. Everything began ringing. And about uh, 15 security, op security offers, uh, officers suddenly converged on me as I was approaching the barnyard. They didn't come over to me, but they were coming out of the building like it seemed from everywhere. And uh, I thought, oh my lands, what have I done now? And uh, I walked in and just got, and I kept walking, and. Uh, the young lady was gone by that time. Apparently, I'd taken the wrong turn. And uh, a man came out in front of them, and he said, uh, Dr. Dieter? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what had happened, but I said to him, uh, well, I really caused a stir. He said, oh, that was a, that was a short circuit. <laughs> so that's my, that's my experience with the home, Holders Camp Meeting site at Broadlands. But it's a delightful and beautiful place. Now. We're back to uh, questions. We'll take. Dr. Dieter, was the tension between the Keswick movement and the Wesleyan movement, um, although we, it was a difference between eradication and suppression, was the real issue free will? No, I don't think free will entered into it because Keswick by this time had pretty well, had pretty well given up the doctrines of strict predestination. They, they were where, you know, they were revivalists. They were in the revival atmosphere. And by the time revivalism became dominant or finny, uh, free will was a question that basically, basically died as far as accepting Christ. They gradually, as Billy Graham does, they were like Billy Graham. He believes that anybody he preaches to can respond to the message of God, can respond to the message of God. He believes anybody can do that. But the problem is there's no free will once you are saved. So as I often said in my classes now for, for 50 years, what the, what the new Calvinism did, it cut off the top of Calvinism, if you want to look at it as a triangle, which goes down finally to perseverance that you can't be lost. Cut it, was cut, it was cut and uh, paste, that's right, in my mind. And they took the Arminianism and put it on the top because as they faced, as I said, as revivalists faced huge audiences, just wasn't much inspiration to preach to whoever was elect there and you 
looked at a person, you didn't know whether you're speaking to him or her or not because they wouldn't even be hearing the message because God's not giving them spiritual inspiration. So that didn't work. But it was hard to give up the other perseverance, which is confidence and so forth. And uh, so free will was not really, not really the issue. It was the flesh that was the issue. It was whether or not we could get rid of the inclination to the flesh, to evil in this life or not. Because they said that if you do that, it's sinless perfection, which very simply cannot be so because Adam was more perfect than we are. He was perfect as God made him as a first man, and he had a free will, we believe. Well, we know he did because God gave him choices and not Eve choices. And the simple fact was that perfect man fell. So perfection of heart does not mean sinless perfection. But that is something that it's very hard, as I well know and all other uh, workers in this area of theology and history know, it's almost impossible to get uh, those who are committed to the other doctrine to say that is not sinless perfection. They say, well, how can you fall if God has given you a perfect heart? Well, I always say very quickly, and I think it's legitimate, like Adam did. And uh, if that holds, it's an adequate answer, and I think it is. I think it is. There are many other scriptures, which the whole of scripture, I think, backs up the fact of uh, the ability to fall, as we said yesterday. Someone said, when a Presbyterian falls, he hits the Westminster Confession and sticks there, you know, they, because of the strong emphasis on logic and confession and creed in, in the pr Presbyterian and other churches. When a Wesleyan or a Methodist falls, he goes straight to hell. <laughs> because it's all, it's, all on that, it's all on that point. <laughs> well, fortunately, that's not true. God doesn't. We've got more security than that. But it, make, it makes a point. And uh, so Keswick is a very, very important movement, still is, and uh, has saved many thousands of young men and women now for the Christian church. But uh, that's the difference between the Wesleyan and Keswick view. But as I said, they mix up pretty much in a non-theological world in which uh, being filled with the Spirit is made equivalent of being sanctified. It can be if you have the content to it. But being filled with the Spirit may not emphasize the fact that God wants us to have clean and pure hearts and we can have them. Not just because Christ is wrapped around our sin. Let me get this in quickly. We have the holiness of God living in us. It's still God's holiness. But it's not that Jesus just wraps around our sin so when you hear this often, when God looks at us, <clears throat> He can't see the sin. Now that is true of those things which we're not responsible for. But God wants us to have an actual holiness, which is His holiness, not ours, in our hearts so that we can be like Christ. Not just God seeing Him. How do other people see us? And of course, they won't see us through Christ. They're going to see us whether or not Christ is in us. And that's the difference.